This is Easter Sunday morning, 2020. The passage for the scripture today in Sunday school is Matthew 28, verses 1 to 10, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. The title of the lesson is Jesus' Resurrection. Typically, when I begin to study a passage of scripture, I do a modified sentence diagram. I'm sure many of you have remember fondly uh, and have warm memories of doing sentence diagramming in your high school English classes. But this uh, diagramming helps me to see the important words and structures that affect my understanding of the passage. When I started doing that with these verses, it quickly became apparent that there was a lot of movement here and a, a lot of important things in so many of these phrases. Some of the phrases are as short as two or three words, but yet highly important. Matthew's portrayal of the resurrection is different than those of the other gospel writers. He doesn't have patience for anything that's taking very much time. There are things to be accomplished and there are people that need to hear this news. In the, the first six verses, uh, we hear about the facts of the resurrection. And I wanna read those for you now, verses one through six of Matthew 28. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. For he has risen just as he said, come see the place where he was lying. Let's look at uh, some of the facts of this resurrection narrative. The Jewish Sabbath was over. Now the women could go to the tomb and see what was going on. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, who was quite probably the mother of Jesus, got underway early that Sunday morning while it was just getting light. Matthew doesn't have them going to do anything, but simply to look at the grave. While they were on their way, an earthquake occurred. We can assume that a couple of things happened at that same moment. One, the angel rolled away the stone, and two, Jesus was raised from the dead. When the Marys arrive, this is the scene they saw and is what scripture describes. The stole, the stone is no longer in front of the, of the tomb. The tomb is wide open and unoccupied. The angel who rolled the stone away now sits triumphantly on it. His appearance was as bright as lightning. His clothing was white as snow. In uh, Matthew chapter 17, we read the story of the transfiguration of Jesus, wherein the appearance of Jesus is described like this. It says that his face shone like the sun and his garments white as light. Sounds pretty similar to this uh, apparel and appearance of the angel, doesn't it? This event was so traumatic for the guards that they fell to the ground like dead men. The formerly dead Jesus has walked out of the tomb as a live man, and now the living guards are struck down and became like dead men. There was plenty of fear to go around. The guards had it, and so did the women. We probably understand this matter of fear a little more clearly in these days than we typically would. The coronavirus has brought home to us a new sense of the fragility of life and a sense of how quickly life can go from healthy to desperately sick. 
So getting back to the passage here, the angel responds to the women and says, do not be afraid. The angel recognizes that they're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. This is an interesting verb. It is a perfect participle. I, uh, I know many of you studied those at some point in your life, but like me, you probably have forgotten what they are. Uh, that participle could be translated like this, having been crucified. That kind of a verb describes something that has happened and the results continue. Jesus was crucified and yet he continues to be the crucified Christ. Then come three short statements describing the event of resurrection. The angel said, he is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Then the Marys verify the resurrection by seeing where Jesus had been lying. Move to verses seven and eight with me. The angel says to them, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. Back in verse five, looking at this encounter with the angel, the first thing the angel says to them is do not be afraid. My first reaction when I hear those words is, that's easy for you to say. Certainly, they will be in awe, but he doesn't want them to be fearful that something bad has happened or is about to happen. The angel affirms to them that the Jesus they are seeking is indeed the one who has been crucified and in a very significant manner, will always be the crucified Christ. His crucifixion is the foundation of our salvation. So forever he will be the crucified Christ because there will always be a need for the efficacy of his crucifixion in the lives of people. Having affirmed Jesus' resurrection, the angel now tells them to take the message they have received and become messengers to Jesus' disciples. Twice the angel uses the word behold or look. Once in relation to the message Jesus wants the Marys to convey, and the second time to let the Marys know that he, the angel, has completed his task as a messenger to them. In verse seven, the angel tells them to go quickly and to tell. Then in verse eight, we see that the Marys left the tomb quickly and ran to report it. They obeyed quickly. Perhaps the most significant phrase in these two verses is sandwiched in between those two phrases. And the phrase is this, with fear and great joy. The words fear and joy almost seem oxymoronic when placed in such close proximity to one another. How can they exist together? Fear here is the sense that they are in the midst of a moment that is, is incomparable and their great joy is the overwhelming sense at learning that Jesus is indeed alive. Let's move now to verses nine and 10. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them as they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee and there they will see me. First, the Marys had an encounter with the angel and now an encounter with Jesus. Here again, we run into this word, behold, drawing attention to the, what uh, is taking place in front of them, Jesus meeting them and greeting them. 
as they turn and run from the garden, run from the angel, and run from the empty tomb, they run right into the resurrected Jesus. The scripture says that Jesus met them and greeted them. Here, Matthew uses very plain language to describe how Jesus greets them. It almost as if a, as he says to them, hi. Can you even begin to imagine the emotion they felt? At this moment, they go from being secondhand witnesses to being primary witnesses. They have seen the resurrected Jesus. It seems as though the Marys have no other option but to run, throw themselves on the ground at Jesus' feet and worship him. How could they do any less? Jesus says to them, do not be afraid. Uh, again, those words appear. And again, the intent is to remind them that there is nothing dreadful about this moment. The Marys have seen the resurrected Jesus, worshiped at his feet, heard reassuringly from him, and now are admonished to take the news, be the messengers to the disciples. Jesus' words were, go and take my word to my brethren. I think it is not of little consequence that the first witnesses of the resurrection and the first messengers of the resurrection are women. How could any person or any church ever, ever demean the place of women in ministry considering this? The disciples are about to receive two amazing pieces of news. One, Jesus is alive, and two, he has called them brothers. Can the news possibly be any better than that for them? Brothers, they are to Jesus. Last week, I taught the lesson that was founded upon the story of the crucifixion of Christ. It is an awful, ugly, almost horrifying true story that needs to be told. We need to tell it and hear it as hard as it is. This week, we have studied the story based on the resurrection of Jesus. It is an amazing, exciting, awesome, true story that must be told. It almost seems as though it should just burst from us. It is such good news. It is intriguing, but not coincidental, that both the angel and the Christ tell the Marys, do not be afraid, go and tell. That same admonition applies to us today. Jesus wants us to be in awe of the amazing good news that is the resurrection. But he does not want us to be fearful in regard to anything. He also desires us to be filled with great joy, knowing that salvation is ours because of his selfless death on the cross and being filled with great joy. Let others see that in us. One of the Easter songs that gets sung in so many churches on this day is the song, Christ the Lord is risen today. Let me read just a few of the lines from that uh, great song. It goes, soar we now where Christ has led, alleluia following our exalted head, alleluia. Made like him, like him we rise, alleluia. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies, alleluia. The word Easter tagged to this day carries with it a lot of other implications. Maybe resurrection should be our best word for this day. In line with that, I say to you, have a joyous Resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.